that allows me to refresh their XPS 13. They've made it smaller, lighter, they use space age aerogel insulation and promote their new power management, which maintains a high performance uh, when it is needed and low power when it is not. They are touting a near 20 hour battery life with excellent thermals. So what do you get for your hard earned cash and is it worth it? Well, let's find out. Hi, this is Stephen from Owner Disown. I have had this uh, new Dell XPS 13 for about a week and I've put it through its paces. Now, let me jump straight to, to my conclusion. Do I actually think it is worth the cost of admission? Well, no, not really. Now, don't get me wrong. It is a beautifully crafted machine. The chassis being machined uh, out of aluminium and it's uh, anodized silver or gold. The silver one has a carbon fiber palm rest and my rose gold one here has a white woven glass surface. That can easily be mistaken for plastic and indeed, at first glance, it did remind me of one of those old netbooks. Now, Dell claims it has a stain resistant surface and indeed, pen does wipe off nicely, even if it is a Sharpie pen. But at $999 for the 128 gigabyte model with four gigs of RAM, that is a lot. I mean, 128 gigabytes in 2018 doesn't get you very far. Even the next level up, which, which I have, um, gets you 256 gigs for $1,200. Now, it is competitive compared to the likes of the Surface Laptop or the Surface Book 2, but remember, the latter can be upgraded to have a dedicated GTX 1050 and has pen support for, for about the same price as the uh, XPS 13. Now, two things this does have going for it uh, compared to the Surface line is that at least you can go in and upgrade the SSD storage yourself, and it has Thunderbolt 3 support. In my opinion, the Lenovo Yoga 720 13-inch is better value. You basically get the same specs as, uh, as this one for $850. Now, that's $350 cheaper, and you get pen support. Now, I know this is not a gaming device per se, but you know I've put five games on here, and you're left with no space. So you're scrambling for a micro SD card to expand that storage. So on the right-hand side, you have the micro SD card reader, a USB-C with PowerShare and DisplayPort, and you have a headphone jack. Now, it's not a mic jack, so you will have to make do with the 4R8 uh, built-in mic, which actually, to be fair, does a good job. And on the left-hand side, you have a Noble Lock, two Thunderbolt 3 ports with PowerShare, and uh, these have uh, four PCI Express lanes and a battery level gauge, which I find is pretty useful. I connected uh, two external monitors using, the, uh, uh, using a Thunderbolt and uh, a USB-C port, and the image was just as good as using my desktop. Now, since all models come with an infinity edge display, whereby the bezels are very narrow and the glass reaches right to the edge, the webcam is placed at the bottom, which is not ideal for video conferencing. So, webcam test. This is what it looks and sounds like. And as you can see, you get a good shot of your nostrils. Uh, very, very peculiar. And also, when you've got your hand gestures, it looks like you've got massive hands. <laughs> clear, it's clear, it's 720p. Uh, so this is what it looks and sounds like. Now, in other words, to get it to, uh, to any normal viewing angle, you have to lift it up in the air like that. My unit has the i5-8250U CPU, which has a base clock of 1.6 gigahertz and a boost of 3.4. Now, $1,450 will get you the supposedly faster i7-8550U CPU with a base clock of 1.8 and a turbo of 4 gigahertz but it still only has 256 gigabytes of storage and eight gigs of RAM. Now I do say supposedly because I'm telling you now, the laptop thermal laptop throttles and it doesn't sustain even a 3.4 gigahertz boost. Paying the extra $250 on this model makes absolutely no sense if it can't maintain that 3.4. It definitely is not gonna maintain four gigahertz on the i7. That also means then that for the top uh, model at $2,050, you're getting an extra 256 gigabytes of storage eight more gigs of RAM uh, to make it 16 and a 4K panel. Now this is $850 over my model. And to be fair, do you need 4K on this? I don't think so. My 1080p panel is made by Sharp and has good color reproduction. 98% of sRGB, 68% of NTSC, and 74% of Adobe RGB. 
it is nice and sharp and plenty bright. Even at 50%, it is still brighter than the HP NV360 at full brightness. But it needs to be because it has a non-touch display. It is very reflective outside, making it very hard to use in, say, a car. But indoors, it is great and has, has excellent viewing angles. Now, looking side by side to my uh, OLED Alienware 13, it is just as vibrant. Backlight bleed isn't too bad either. Now, I have a little bit on the left-hand side, but it pales next to the uh, OLED Alienware, which is solid black. It is very small and thin, as you can see here uh, compared to, to my Alienware 13 and an iPad. How about build quality? Well, sure, the back is solid uh, aluminum and the palm rest keyboard area is solid, but there's a definite give at the edge of the screen. So much so that I can actually see light through a slight gap. The trackpad uses Windows Precision Drivers and it is awesome. Gestures work great as does tracking, scrolling and pinch to zoom. The keyboard is also very good. It has a good distance of travel considering how, uh, I know how thin this thing is and I don't think it feels too mushy either. I also like how you can alter the volume and key brightness without having to press the FN key. There are three levels of brightness. Uh, there's off, there's low and there's max. Now strangely, to alter the screen brightness, you have two separate buttons that actually need to, to use the FN key to make them work. The included charger and dongle are white to match, uh, to, to match the rest of the aesthetics here, which I think is a nice touch. Since there's no full-size USB-A port, you need to use this uh, dongle, and uh, I find that quite annoying. I know I have a habit of uh, losing these things, so I tend to keep it, keep it plugged in, and then of course it wobbles around. Inside, we have a Toshiba PCI Express SSD with write speeds of about 350 megabytes per second and read speeds of 1300 megabytes per second. Now, I was expecting it to be a little bit faster on the boot time, to be honest. It's not dreadful at 33 seconds. Um, the power button doubles as a fingerprint reader, which is, uh, is nice, and I do prefer that over Windows LO. Perhaps the slower boot up time is uh, because of all the Dell bloatware that's installed, or even perhaps due to the quite extensive BIOS. You can change the uh, boot sequence, SATA operation, Thunderbolt support, dynamic backlight control allows you to adjust the, the backlight brightness according to the intensity of a video on the screen. You can choose uh, the number of cores available. You can enable or disable turbo boost and enable it. Uh, you can even enable or disable hyper threading. Now, disabling these options will lower the performance but will decrease the temperatures. Under power management management, you have advanced battery charge configuration. This allows you to specify your, your work period, uh, so you can uh, use express charge uh, for those periods and uh, do the other periods, you just use a standard charge method. Now I found using express charge, it takes 26 minutes to charge it up by about 30%. You actually have four battery charge options, which I think is nice. Now you can have it, either have it whether it adapts to your usage pattern, uh, standard charging, so it'll, you know, it'll charge up like normally, uh, continuously. You can use the fast charging or the primary AC use. Now I like this one because you can configure it to start and stop charging at certain percentages and this promotes battery longevity. Now there are two one watt speakers at the sides and at first I thought these were going to suck. But the Waves audio software really helps boost it to about 78 decibels and indeed it can fill a room very easily. Now cool air is brought in from underneath and is blown out venting at the screen hinge. The back panel is held in place using uh, Torx 5 screws and is made of solid aluminium. Now, to be honest, I cannot see where this aerogel insulating material is. Now, perhaps it is transparent. Perhaps it's a transparent coating on the inside of the panel, but I could not see it. Well, inside you can see that uh, half the space is taken up with the 52 watt hour battery. Now, Dell claims that uh, you just get short of 20 hours battery life on the 1080p model. Now, perhaps this was, uh, you know, tested at zero brightness because all I was able to get was 12 hours and that was with 25% brightness. Still, that is more than uh, adequate and will easily last you through a full day and was better than the 15-inch Surface Book 2. Now, gaming on it, yeah, certainly will take a hit and it'll last around about 75 uh, minutes. It has one SSD slot so you can upgrade this, but uh, the RAM, I suspect, is underneath. Although I did wonder what was uh, under the silver plate as that had a thermal pad attached to it. Perhaps it was the Wi-Fi card. You also have what looks like a CMOS battery, which is great, um, just in case you ever need to reset the BIOS. So you have two short heat pipes and two small fans. Uh, but you know, this is integrated graphics and it's only a 15 watt TDP chip. So how hot can this get? Well, the fans are really quiet. 
at about 18 decibels at uh, idle and at load they uh, go up to about 25 decibels. I did try using HW Info to change the fan speed and unfortunately it didn't seem to work. Uh, the chassis temperatures are fine at the center of the keyboard it's about 31 degrees Celsius, AWSD key is 33, um, at the right hand side it's 26, the number pad is 25 and underneath 39 degrees. Now running Cinebench R15 benchmark we see it perform on par with the Surface Book 2 um, at uh, stock and that's got the i7. It's not too far be behind the i7 7700HQ but look how hot it gets, 98 degrees Celsius and it averaged a clock rate of 3000 megahertz which is nowhere near the boost of 3400. My handbrake test is a long test and it really does exploit any weaknesses. It takes 48 minutes 42 seconds to encode a 4 gigabyte video file and that's just 10% behind the i7 7700HQ and easily beat the stock Surface Book 2. Despite its whopping 99 degrees, it maintains an average of 2819 MHz clock rate. Now I did run Adobe Lightroom, but I got some strange results, so I, I, I won't include them here. But I did want to mention that the CPU was at 97 degrees. Now what about gaming? Well, first up we have Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Settings have to be dropped to very low and uh, gaming at 1280 by 720. Gameplay was smooth though, and I was getting around 20 frames per second. Now looking at the temperatures, we are at 98 degrees, so that's pretty toasty. Overwatch is a very competitive game, and it needs good frame rates. At 1080p using high settings, I got 48 FPS, which I thought was pretty good, but again the temperature was high at 97 degrees. Rainbow Six Siege is another competitive game, but requires low settings at 720p to get you 42 FPS, and actually this actually is the coolest of the bunch at 90 degrees. Now Battlefield 1 did surprise me, it was very fluid and enjoyable at 720p. DX11 using low settings. There was no stuttering or drop frames, but again the CPU went to 98 degrees. Finally, Rise of the Tomb Raider, it's pretty much not playable at 19 FPS, um, even at the lowest quality settings using DX11 and at 720p. And again the CPU is hot at 96 degrees. So here is a summation on the gaming performance it can play it can actually play many games at 720p low settings, sometimes even some of them at high settings. Now due to the high temperature, uh, the average CPU clock rate was 2756 MHz, again quite far behind the 3400 MHz boost. Now one selling point is that you can actually hook this up to an external gaming box uh, via the Thunderbolt 3 ports, and it does have four PCI Express lanes. So does that make a difference? Well, not really. It still falls slightly behind the 15 inch Yoga 720 that has two PCI Express lanes, but a slightly faster CPU. Still, it makes these games playable at much higher settings and resolutions, whilst also being able to reduce the temperature by about 7 degrees Celsius. Here are some gameplay. CPU usage in Tomb Raider is about 100% and GPU usage about 88%. In Battlefield 1, the CPU usage was around about 50%, but the GPU was about 98%, so that's not bad at all. And gameplay was great. So how do we cool this baby down? Well, first off, I tried an undervolt of 85 millivolts, but it still went to 94 degrees in Cinebench. So what you have to do is lower the turbo boost from 3400 to 3000 megahertz and apply an, un an undervolt. I know this sounds crazy, but once the CPU uh, down clocks to below 3000 anyway, it makes perfect sense and the result is a max 78 degrees in Cinebench and a decent score of 623 points. That is a reduction of 20 degrees Celsius. But can this be replicated over a long test like handbrake or gaming? In handbrake, we actually got a slightly faster time and a max temperature of 92 degrees and no throttling. This is huge and shows that we don't lose performance but gain longevity of the components. And in Battlefield 1 with the boost clock set at 3 GHz, the CPU uh, undervolted by 95 millivolts and the Intel graphics undervolted by 190 millivolts, we see a whopping 18 degree reduction and only lose 4 FPS, which to be honest, it was still very playable. So you can see why I do not recommend the i7. It has no chance of boosting up to 4 GHz. You are much better off you know, getting the i5 model and upgrading the small SSD yourself. Now temperatures aside, it is a really nice laptop. I was actually quite tempted to keep it, but when I noticed that gap in the panel um, and seen the light through it, that was the final nail in the coffin for me. Now, if it was a two-in-one with pen support like the Yoga 720 13 inch, it would give it added value and be much more used, to, say, to a business user on the road. So I question, who is this for? 
Now, for the average user who is not going to downclock or do any undervolting, um, you will uh, limit its lifespan due to the heat it produces, uh, unless you use it for something like uh, Windows or Excel. And you know what? You can certainly get a cheaper option for that. Anyway, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.